We are back, and you're tuned to the Critical Hour here on Radio Sputnik. I'm your host, Dr. Wilmer Leon. Well, Iran, to begin injecting uranium gas into 1,044 centrifuges, this is the latest step away from the 2015 nuclear deal. It puts more pressure on EU signatories to counteract crippling U.S. sanctions. My next guest has written a great piece entitled Confronting the Islamic Republic, Trump versus Rhodes Roundtable. He writes, there seems to be solid disagreements among the circles of power about how much to escalate tensions with Iran. The basis for these differences and what they represent is worth examining carefully. And that's what he does. He's a frequent collaborator with all major news outlets and author of City Builders and Vandals in Our Age. Caleb Mop and Caleb, welcome back. Sure. Glad to be here as always. So, What's the correlation between uh, Cecil Rhodes' roundtable and where we are today? Well, uh, Carol Quigley, Dr. Carol Quigley, who was kind of a mentor of U.S. President Bill Clinton, was an academic who consulted and was hired by the U.S. Department of Defense. He did a lot of writing, um, and one of his books is called The Anglo-American Establishment. And in that book, he lays out that, you know, at the time of his death, death uh, Cecil Rhodes, who was a big advocate of British imperialism, uh, you know, Rhodesia, which Zimbabwe before it wants independence, uh, you know, was, was called Rhodesia, named after Cecil Rhodes. Uh, he created the Rhodes Scholar Program, and he laid the basis for what is now the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, he essentially, in his will, uh, called for the creation of what he referred to as a secret society that were maintaining the ideals of the British Empire. Um, it eventually just kind of degenerated into, you know, I mean, at first it was called the Round Table, and it was just a, an association. It wasn't a secret society in the, you know, in the, you know, the, you know, the scary sense. No, no password, no secret code, but an association of people who shared uh, shared the outlook of some of the wealthiest people in Britain. And at first it was called the Round Table, and out of that we get the Council on Foreign Relations, um, and we get a lot of different institutes. Uh, we get the Rockefeller think tanks, uh, and it was just kind of a network of globally oriented. Thinkers, uh, uh, and they represent a very powerful faction in U.S. politics today. Um, you know, many of the most prominent voices in American politics, I mean, almost all of them are part of the Council on Foreign Relations. It is where U.S. foreign policy strategy is developed uh, over the long term. Um, it's also where uh, a lot of academic research takes place, and it constitutes one axis within the U.S. power structure, both the business community and the government agencies. How does all that now tie to the uh, military-industrial complex and their whole whole idea of peace through strength, and also with the uh, oil companies talking about a drill now? Well, that's what is quite interesting, because you'll notice um, that, that you know Trump's strategy on Iran is a huge break with the strategy of the Obama administration. Uh, U.S. President Obama favored softening sanctions, negotiating, creating the nuclear deal along with John Kerry. Um, and the idea was to get closer to Iran, increase American influence in Iran, de-escalate tensions, um, and, and obviously to then gradually increase influence uh, among the, of the United States and Iran to the point that perhaps maybe some political unrest could lead to regime change. Whereas if you look at what the Trump administration is doing, it they seem to have the opposite effect. They seem to be doing everything they can to escalate tensions, whether it's ripping up the nuclear deal, uh, whether it's uh, you know continued provocative moves, dramatic sanctions, declaring uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran to be terrorists. The Trump administration is doing everything it can to escalate tensions with Iran. And if you look at who Donald Trump's backers are, this makes sense. Um, you know, one of the main supporters of pro-Trump political voices in the United States is the DeVos Foundation. Uh, that's the, the, you know, the wealth uh, being distributed of, of Betsy DeVos, the educational secretary. Um, and they fund a lot of pro-Trump uh, activism and pro-Trump uh, political voices in the United States. And they are also military contractors. The more that countries surrounding Iran that are aligned with the United States, like Kuwait, like Saudi Arabia, you know, the more they purchase weapons, the more, uh, the more military contractors are deployed to the Middle East, uh, the more money uh, the Betsy DeVos family is going to make. Uh, you look at Home Depot. And the owners of Home Depot, they are tied in with defense contractors, have quite a bit of money to be made from weapons and, and other escalations. You look at the fracking companies, for example. The fracking companies are, are particularly worried right now because as much as, as Trump tries to keep the price of oil high, the price of oil keeps dropping, and they're already having difficulty paying back their loans. Wall Street is very, very worried about the fracking companies who continue to not consistently be paying back their loans. So if you put all of this factor in there, 
it seems like the strategy of escalating tension between the United States and Iran and the strategy of actually conducting regime change and overthrowing the Iranian government don't always coincide. There's a lot of money to be made for Trump's backers in the short term uh, when it comes to escalating tensions with Iran. But a strategy, a long term strategy of regime change, as Obama carried out with Libya, where, you know, we will remember that with Libya, there was there was a, a softening, uh, you know, there was deals made, there was an opening up, there was an extension of American influence in Libya, and then a political crisis fomented that eventually brought down the government. Uh, that was a strategy of de-escalating, increasing American influence in the country, and then dividing the country, letting, creating a political crisis. Whereas it seems that the Trump administration's strategy regarding Iran is to increase tension as much as possible uh, in order to make profits for Trump's backers in the short term. You write, the Islamic Republic of Iran has been in the crosshairs of the Eastern establishment since it was born in the 1979 revolution. The Iranian government came to power with slogans of neither East nor West, not capitalism, but Islam, and war of poverty against wealth. You go on to write, in essence, the non-Western, non-capitalist revolutionary government of the Islamic Republic is everything that Cecil Rhodes Society was established to oppose. And I think to your point about bringing Libya into the conversation, there are a number of countries that fit that description. Indeed. And and the strategy, again, is do you engage in soft power? Uh, do you manipulate events within a country? Do you spread the influence of the West in order to create instability? Or do you just escalate military tensions with these countries uh, in, in order, to, in order to, to spend more money on weapons and eventually perhaps you know, risk the danger of things exploding into a real hot war? That has been the divide. And uh, the military-industrial complex have lots of money to make on wars uh, in the short term and lots of money to make on selling weapons and escalating an arms race. Um, but if you look at, at the Soviet Union, for example, right, a, a lot has been written, you know, giving Reagan's uh, arms deals and spending credit for overthrowing the Soviet Union. But in reality, uh, it, it's, it's very apparent that the overthrow of the Soviet Union had a lot more to do with political turmoil in the Soviet Union uh, of, of, you know, inroads being made by Western ideas spreading and by a very, very large percentage of the Soviet Communist Party being sympathetic to the United States. Um, and, you know, we saw the coup with Gorbachev. And if you look at it, it wasn't a military defeat uh, that, that, that overthrew the Soviet Union. It was actually the efforts to, to create turmoil in the country, undermine faith in the leadership, divide the leadership. All of that played an important role. Um, and and this, this kind of mythology that, that, that the Soviet Union was brought down simply by Reagan, you know, big, Digging, giving dramatic speeches and saying, tear down that wall and spending a lot of money on nukes is just, just a, an obfuscation of reality, right? Um, and that, that these two, these two uh, strategies, the one strategy that you can associate with the Council on Foreign Relations and with Cecil Rhodes, this long-term strategy of rolling back any opposition to Western capitalism, maintaining the rule of Wall Street in London uh, by destabilizing and eventually overthrowing any geopolitical competitor, Versus the strategy of a lot of people who just have a lot of money to be made through escalating conflict, um, and in particular the Israeli Likud party, uh, which you know is very much in the interest of the Israeli Likud party to see tension with Iran go up. The more that Iran can be perceived as a threat, uh, the stronger Netanyahu will be in Israel. Um, and and so, do you want do you want to benefit from short term uh, turmoil and escalation for short term economic and political gain? Or do you have a long-term strategy for actually overturning and overthrowing governments in the way of Wall Street? This division uh, between foreign policy strategies and economic interests seems to almost define uh, U.S. politics for the last few decades. And you go on to write, the Islamic Republic has become a beacon of encouragement to other forces around the world who seek to end the rule of Western capitalism. And one of the things that I've been saying for a very long time is that an imperial hegemon such as the United States can never allow a country such as Iran, a country such as Haiti, a country such as Libya to successfully resist. That that is the bully on the playground. The bully on the playground cannot allow that smaller kid to come and punch him in the face because when that happens, the bully is no more. Well, I, I would say that it's even even more precise than that. It's simply a matter of not tolerating any competition. I, I believe, you know, when I was in Iran, I met many Iranians who were under the impression that if only Iranian leaders would, would not say nasty things about the United States, if only they would stop chanting death to America, 
If they would do that, then the United States would get friendlier to Iran and we could all be friends and be peaceful. Um, but at the end of the day, the opposition to the Islamic Republic of Iran is not really rooted in anything the Iranian leaders say. It's rooted in the fact that Iran is an independent oil-producing country that exports oil on the international markets in competition with uh, ExxonMobil, a primary funder of the Council on Foreign Relations, with British Petroleum, with Chevron. Uh, you know, uh, that seems to be the basis. You know, Iran... When it seized control of its oil resources in the 1979 revolution, it began using those, those oil profits uh, to build up a state-run economy and to build their own car industries and their own aviation and their own steel manufacturing and to, and to also send that money uh, around the world to forces that were trying to resist the rule of Western capitalism, whether it was the Irish Republican Army or, or you know, forces in Latin America or, or anywhere. I mean, Iran, Iranian oil is now, you know, the profits from Iranian oil aren't going to Wall Street bankers. It's going to many things that are against their interests. Uh, if Iran were poor um, and dependent, or if Iran were simply a vassal of the, of the Rockefeller oil companies and such, as it was under the Shah of Iran, the oil was nominally nationalized under the Shah, but it was basically the de facto property of British and American bankers. But now that Iran is an independent economy that is competing, they are going to try and remove it from the market. I mean, let's not forget that Gaddafi, you know, in his final years was very, very friendly to the United States. Very. Obama as his little African son, uh, you know, all kinds of things were done to appease. But it's not about what they say. It's about what they do. And if you exist as a competitor, uh, you are going to be targeted. And as we wrap this up, we know that Gaddafi was trying to compete on a number of levels. He was trying to compete with the European Union. He was trying to develop his own currency. He was aerating the desert. Uh, there were a number of very progressive things. Gaddafi saw himself as an African as opposed to uh, seeing himself as an Arab. There were a number of things that Muammar Gaddafi was supporting and, and was implementing that were proven to be or would, would prove to be in direct competition with the United States, with the European Union, and with many of the other uh, Arab countries. Caleb Moppin, got to stop you here. Fantastic, fantastic piece. Confronting the Islamic Republic, Trump versus Rhodes Roundtable. Where can people get it? Uh, you can get it at my website, calebmoppin.com, C-A-L-E-B-M-A-U-P-I-N.com. Caleb, thank you very much. Really appreciate it, man. Hey, folks, you've been listening to The Critical Hour here on Radio Sputnik. Thank you for allowing my voice into your space. I hope you were informed and enlightened. I look forward to talking with you all right here tomorrow on Radio Sputnik. Be safe. Peace and blessings. I'm out. 